Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to be able to present to you today this topic, which enables me to pull together strands of many themes that are near and dear to me, and also to share with you some um, great ideas for moving forward, not only with your own photography, um, but also with helping the planet to stay beautiful for generations to come. But before I get started on this, I would just like to thank Canon for bringing me out here to speak to you all today. So thanks, Canon. So landscape photography is a term that seems deceivingly simple. If we try to break that down into two words, the term seems as though it should describe itself. But in fact, it's actually a very uh, slippery combination of terms that are indeed difficult to pin down. A landscape, that's the first part of the word, obviously should have something to do with land. And of course, most people do think of landscapes in, in that way. A landscape might be something like this one, where you have a sense for where the photographer is standing, you have a sense for the context, you have a sense for what attracted the photographer to that location, and you have a sense for what sort of environment this is and, and, and uh, how special this moment may be in that place. So land can encompass all of these things. Landscape, as we'll see, actually, is a much bigger concept than any of that. But let's, um, let's move on to the second part of landscape photography. That's the photography part. That too actually is not that de easy to define. For some people, uh, back in the day, photography, once we first went to digital, uh, that didn't count. Right? A photograph was something that was printed on a piece of paper, and that was it. And these definitions have had to change as time has gone on. Photography now involves this incredibly sophisticated equipment, if you can get it. And it really is an absolute uh, just miracle of human achievement that we're able to take this sort of equipment out into nature and work with it and produce what we can with it because a whole lot of collaboration goes on in order for that to happen, not only between you and nature, but also between you and those engineers who actually came up with all of that stuff. So this is, this is my gear that you're seeing here, my Canon gear. I use quite a lot of different lenses. Got a pair of R5s. Um, so the photography part of the equation for me looks like this at the very essence of it. But of course, those two ingredients in landscape photography, the land, the landscape and the photography um, only get us part of the way there. And what I would like to impress upon you today is actually that third ingredient, which is really so important and often gets left out of the equations when we are in discussions of what's going on. And that is the photographer and the role that you play in any photograph that you make. A landscape is so much more than just the land. And it's so much more than just all of that amazing technology that you can throw at it. When you produce a landscape, you're producing a part of yourself. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're putting something of yourself into that, that image. And this starts all the way from when you decide where to go. There are so many creative decisions involved in landscape photography. It can be easy to forget that they are, in fact, decisions. And it can also be very easy for people to see a landscape and think, well, yeah, if I were there, I would take that image too. Right? I'd push the button, sure. <laughs> And it can be very easy to think that where the magic lies is, is in the land. And that can, that can have very negative consequences for the land, as we'll talk about in a bit. So 
So it's not to say that this is really um, a semantic issue between you know, how do we talk about our landscapes. It's, it's also how do we think about them and what, how do we frame them and how do we encourage others to think about them and in fact, what do we do in, in response to those thoughts that we have about them? Indeed, when you go out into a landscape, you don't necessarily just get something like this. Here is a, another photograph from exactly the same location. Okay, it's the same place, different dune around the corner from the other one. All right, and I've, I've overlaid um, a pseudo focus point grid here <laughs> just to give you a sense of the fact that e so many decisions go into creating a landscape even just choosing which focus point sometimes can have a big effect on how your image ends up looking. So you could have something like this. You still have that beautiful sand verbena blooming in the desert, and you still have those beautiful dunes, and you still have that beautiful evening light. Um, but what you have here is only a little bit of the photographer, just a little bit. What happens when you put more of the photographer into it, when you put more of yourself, is you end up with something else. And I feel as though we need to give ourselves credit for that part of the equation, and in fact, allow ourselves to speak about landscape photographs as a collaboration between nature and photographer. In this case, there's a whole lot of me going into this image. It represents a lot of my interests, my compositional interests, my post-processing interests. Speaking of post-processing, a lot of people think that that's, you know, back in the day especially, that has nothing whatever to do with darkroom work and there's this major di division between everything that happens before you press the shutter and everything that happens after. I don't happen to be in that camp I, I embrace all of the tools that I have at my disposal, in, including Photoshop. So my images do probably express that love of playing with the tones and the colors to help tell the story that I want to tell. In this case, the, the story of this incredible, incredibly beautiful, delicate flowers toughing it out in an environment where they seem like they should have no business thriving, and yet they do. That's where they want to be, in this windswept, harsh desert environment, and there they are. For some people, however, Photoshop is just, that's what happens when all else fails. It's a verb de describing that process. <laughs> For me, um, it's a wonderful creative space that can help to bring out more of what you feel and see and experience and more of what your relationship really encompasses with a landscape. And yes, it's actually, this place is pretty crazy. There's actually less Photoshop in this one than, than you might think. So before we get into unpacking all that I've just said, comparing the difference between what is a location and what is a landscape, um, let's just, let's just talk about the idea of looking beyond locations and why that might even be important. Why, why bother? I've already given you a hint about that, but locations essentially are a place where they, they it's a place that stands between coordinates essentially. And what we have in, in the world is the ability to go to those coordinates and produce something these days that is pretty close to something that someone else has produced. That's one option. But we also have an option to consider all that we bring to a place ourselves and to let that factor in as well. We can go to a place and we can think about how much we love locations because what landscape photographer doesn't. In fact, locations have come to define the genre to, to a great extent. Up until 10 years ago, most landscape photographers titled their photographs just after where it was, Mesa Arch at Sunrise, or something like that, right? Um, I tend not to do that, and I'll talk more about that later on, because I would like at least to get nudge people into considering that third part of the equation, which is the photographer, and that relationship that I bring to the whole equation. But yeah, we love locations, right? We, re we create location books. We might create location galleries. We have location bucket lists. 
Uh, if we didn't have the locations, we wouldn't have the photography. They are important, no doubt, and indeed, even just straightforward documentation of locations is of extreme value, especially in a day when so many of them are disappearing, either because of uh, climate change or because of things that happen because of human visitation. But I'm not saying that there is a zero-sum game here between, under, between focusing on locations and focusing on landscapes, but it is an important distinction, and it helps for all of us to make that distinction loom large in what we're doing. For example, when I'm out in the desert photographing a space, I don't necessarily have to photograph that especially famous view next to me, but I might. If I don't, though, if I go to a place and I think in terms of only uh, the location that it is, that might cut off avenues of exploration and avenues of consideration because if my goal is to document the location purely and not put something of myself into it, I may think that certain decisions need to follow. I may go there and, and, and I may be closed off to seeing anything that I didn't know already existed there. For example, in this place, I'm standing right next to a very iconic view, way off to my left. Uh, it just wasn't what was of interest to me at the moment. Instead, I saw this wonderful undulating light working its way across the desert in the background at 400 millimeters. So just exploring with the telephoto lens, I didn't even need to move my feet. I was able to come away with something where I had something to say, and I could infuse a little bit more of myself into it. Exact same location as that iconic composition. Now, it's not to say that those iconic compositions aren't important and indeed in some cases even necessary. We, we definitely need people to document the wonderful world as well. But if you move beyond that, if you look beyond locations, there's a world, the whole world is your oyster and there's so much out there uh, that you can do. For example, this is an image from the French Alps. It's a place that um, is pretty high up in, in the mountains, and it's not a place that just anyone <laughs> tends to go, but those who do go um, are usually very enthralled by a set of cascades that are the first thing you see when you get up onto this high plain. And in fact, when I told a friend of mine who had been there that I was going, um, he said, oh, you, you, don't, you know about the cascades, don't you? I didn't actually. He said, oh, you gotta, you gotta shoot the cascades. They're the coolest thing, they're right up at the front. Uh, and so then I looked up a few images and I wasn't able to find many because believe me, this isn't the place that a lot of people go. But the few that I did find, indeed, they included those cascades. Um, but when I went up there, I, you know, I just wanted to look at what else was there. Now, like I said, it's not easy to get to this place. It's close to 4,000 feet in elevation gain. It's a very rugged environment, very rocky. Uh, you have to really be willing to get up there, get out there and hoof it for a while. Uh, but it's an incredible place, and indeed the water is really impressive. If you go beyond those cascades, there's loads of it. This area has a lot of glacial melt coming down, and I spent the first day, I went up there twice, two days in a row, and spent the first day just exploring the water beyond the cascades. I thought that was pretty marvelous, and, and that, was, that was definitely an interesting process of thinking through the water and being attracted to all of that. But then my own instincts started to kick in. I found this tiny little patch of flowers, and here I am doing a little focus stack of them. And those really charmed me the most. As much as I enjoyed the water, and I did work some photographs of it, it was sitting there with those, that little patch of flowers um, that, that really, really did it for me because I saw a story there. Now, I could have come away with just something from the water, and it would still be that location, just right to the side of where I'm standing is, is water, right? So here's an image, again, with that, that overlay of the focus points, just to remind you that the magic doesn't lie only in the location. There's a little bit of the photographer in this image, but just a little bit. This is me walking around, just sort of taking sort of record shots and trying to just sort out what, what all interests me, get, 
get it out of my system that there's water there, play with it. But what happens when the photographer pours more of themselves into the image? You eventually find that story, that connection that comes from your relationship with the land. And in this case, the way that those rocks embrace those flowers really reminds me of what I was talking about with the flowers in the desert. That somehow that's where these flowers want to live and they thrive there in this crazy rugged environment and, the, and there aren't a ton of them as you saw in the video, they're just little patches. But there they are, I called this one the walled garden. That was my name for it. So now I could have photographed just the mountain in a million different ways. And that is an important, beautiful mountain. A mountain with that kind of a pyramidal structure, um, you know, it's, it's exceedingly attractive. So it's not like I just didn't photograph the mountain. Like I said with that, earlier image where the, there was an iconic view off to my left. Well, in this case, I photographed what was the most big and amazing thing that I could have, right? Um, but in a way that spoke to me and that, that told a story about that area. So what happens, though, if we put too much emphasis on just the location, if we're telling people, I photographed this place, and we have nothing more to say about it, or if we're telling people, if you want a great shot, go to this place, You'll, this is what you can do there. Or and if we leave out that part of the equation that is you, the photographer, what happens? What is lost? What is at stake? And I think it's really important to talk about that part of it for conservation purposes. Because what happens when places get too much visitation? when you direct people too much to a place because they think that's where the magic lies, you end up with loss, right? The lights go out on that place eventually. Imagine if in 1930, Edward Weston produced Pepper Number 30, and he put that on Instagram, <clears throat> and everybody said, oh man, I need to find this pepper field because that pepper is where the magic lies. And so they all go running to the pepper field, wielding cameras, and completely trample it. <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of, I laugh, but it is kind of what's happening these days. There are entire areas now where wildflowers no longer grow because they have been trampled. It, it really is a problem. So is, is the answer to, to close off these places so no one could, could go there? I'd like to think not. Right? I'd like to think that going to these areas and being able to explore them for yourself should be part of our discourse, part of our conversations with ourselves and with everyone else who we talk to and who, with everyone who sees our images. We photographers are the, one who've create, are the ones who've created the problem, really. You know, we are the ones who are perpetuating that problem not because we don't mean well, we do, we love our locations. And we care about them, we wanna celebrate them, and we want to talk about them. But we need to be mindful, I think, of what role we play in actually producing them and give ourselves some credit for that. So now that I've said all of that, now I've said what are locations and what is at stake in this this creation of a landscape photograph, let's, let's, just, let's just unpack that term landscape a little bit more. What is a landscape anyway? Now it might seem like it's pretty straightforward, as I said, but actually a landscape, all right, that's different than, than just land, and it's different than just a set of coordinates. Landscape is essentially a mental construct. It's a mental construct built up of traditions, of stories, of mythologies, of all of the experiences that people have had going to other places that might remind them of this one or experiences that they've had in that place. You can't unexperience a place. You can't unexperience your concept of land. Even if you've even just seen it in a movie, you're probably coming away with ideas about areas about biomes. And it's helpful to appreciate that what people get out of seeing your images is so much more than just going to that 
location and appreciating that it needs to be protected. That's one thing. They also can see your images and they can, they can dream a little, right? A, 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 land, a landscape brings with it so much, so much that you put into it if you've, if you've, if you've done, done that, but also so much that they bring to it, your viewer. I often say that the, the, the viewer will often see more than you ever intended, right? They'll understand more than you had in mind. And you probably had in mind more than they'll ever understand. And that's okay, because that's how art works. That's actually one of the cool things about it, that beautiful open-endedness that is creation, right? So um, I don't think I can put it any better than uh, a guy who went absolutely viral in 2010 in a YouTube video. Perhaps you've seen this one. He's outside, and there's this beautiful double rainbow forming. And you know this, this video, and he's out there, and the rainbow's just getting brighter and brighter, and he's having a very, very intense emotional moment. A and what does he say? It's a double rainbow. Anyone know this one? A double rainbow all the way. What does it mean? You know that one, right? It, it's really, it's, you know, it's wonderful if anyone can have that kind of a response to nature. It really is. <laughs> uh, and as a landscape photographer, it's wonderful if you can bring some of that to people to give them that, that sense of that wonder, that sense of wonder. But another thing that landscapes can do is call on all of those traditions and all of those mythologies for people and, and let them just dream a little about things that may have nothing whatever to do with specifically that land or that moment. For example, that image that I just showed you earlier of, of the desert landscape with the rainbows Wide open areas like that are not everywhere in the world. And in fact, the, here, we, here in the American West, we're very lucky to have a lot of it. And that's why landscape photography is so, um, so very popular and, and almost uh, born here. You know, there are a lot of landscape photographers all over the world, but uh, the United States certainly has a lot of those absolutely classic vistas because we just have so much of these wide open spaces. And, and even before the age of photography, back in the age of painting, that kind of expansiveness of the land became very wrapped up with the concept of freedom, especially for Westerners who were leaving the East and going West to obtain freedom in these wide open expanses of space. And so therefore, when we go somewhere else, this is Iceland, for example, we do tend to take those ideas with us. Those, those are parts of the mythologies that I was talking about that tend to, tend to stay with us. And depending on what you bring to landscape and your own experiences, um, they play out in your own decision making, in your own relationships with that land, and in the way that people view what you've done. Likewise, mountains. I'm, I'm largely a mountain photographer. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. Mountains are known in the mythologies of many cultures as places that are close to the gods. And it's hard not to, even, even if it's just subconsciously, it's hard not to have some kind of sense of awe of mountains on that level. Regardless of what you believe, and whether or not you believe Zeus lives on Mount Olympus or not. <laughs> Um, you know, these sorts of environments do carry those mythologies and traditions with them, depending on who, who's viewing them. It's never going to be absolute, of course, but it's a thing. So having, having laid out what it is that's at stake and what is really different between pursuing a location and pursuing a landscape, what I'd like to do now is give you some sense of how you can actually put some of these ideas to work for you and how you can put a little bit more of your own good self into your landscapes. So what I've tried to do is break this down, these ideas down into five 
helpful habits that you can get into. And there's a little bit of overlap between these. But I think that uh, if you go out and you think that you're having trouble moving beyond the idea that you're in this particular location, that these five habits can help you to sort of move beyond that. So I'm going to, uh, in the interest of trying to make them somewhat memorable, <laughs> keep them brief in titles here. Light before landmarks, hide and seek, embrace the unknown, connect the dots, and speak softly. So you'll see what I mean about each of these in a minute. So let's talk about light before landscapes. So when you go somewhere, and you know that there's something really amazing on offer, as I said earlier, it can be hard to see what you don't know is there because you're so fixated on what is. Now this, this image is one that really speaks to me, and it is not a famous mountain, and in fact, it's not even the most prominent mountain. It's probably about the 30th most prominent mountain in my view. I'm photographing it at 400 millimeters, from an area where I had a 360 degree view, a view of mountains. I had a lot to choose from. <laughs> it didn't have to be this one. And in fact, there were a couple of really famous peaks nearby. And it would be very easy to go to this place and say, if you go there, you have the best possible view of this other famous mountain. So I, of course, I, I feel somehow obliged to photograph the other famous mountain. But if instead you go up there and you think, I'm just going to respond and I'm going to think about what I see and what the light is showing me, you might see this. So I just love the way that this mountain seemed to be catching light at the very most interesting part of it, almost like it's sending signals out into space or something. Uh, and it's very suggestive to me and I love these kinds of moments of visual poetry that are much easier to find if you're just allowing yourself to. Sometimes there are areas where you can find a photograph that will never be there again. <laughs> Atmosphere is great in this regard. So this is actually an image from Death Valley where I spend a lot of time. I teach a lot of workshops there. On this particular day, when this cloud inversion was happening, none of the landmarks could have been more interesting to me. And, uh, and Fortunately, my workshop that was with me agreed. <laughs> they had so much fun really thinking through their options for this incredible expanse of uh, the, the park that was covered with this incredible atmosphere. And the telephoto lenses came out, and if you've never seen a bunch of photographers that dialed into what they're doing, you really should because it's a beauty, beautiful thing to see. See people that are just responding so intensely to what they're seeing and, and all pointing in different directions because they're just, they're all, the point is they're seeing, right? Um, they're, not, they're not just going for the landmark. Now there's nothing wrong with, with landmarks. I do, I do really appreciate them. As I said, I showed you, you know, sometimes I'll, I'm absolutely trying to find a way to tell a story about a landmark, but it's not the only way. Sometimes I'll be standing right next to a, a, a landmark. It's another one of those occasions. There is one of the most famous now massifs. Uh, when I first started going there, it wasn't, but uh, now it is. Uh, just to the right of me here. And this is, again, another one of these super telephoto landscapes where you wouldn't have even seen it if you hadn't had that telephoto lens out to find it. We were hunting around <laughs> and could see in the distance this incredible moment of light and the way that these two peaks seem to be kind of leaning into each other for a little dance, uh, their charming veils fluttering behind them. These sorts of moments really get my imagination going and it's incredibly fun to find them. Finding the light is really, really fun if, if you just allow yourself to do that. So here is a scene, forests, you know, forest scenes are I just sort of eternally complicated. But if you go into them thinking that, maybe you'll just go look for the biggest, most famous tree. <laughs> but if you go into them thinking, where's the light? There's, there's so much that you can do. 
just going to find where, what, where is the light? How can I frame the light? How can I tell some story about the light coming into this charming, magical environment? On this moment, I was snowshoeing around for days looking for the light. <laughs> Uh, and I was in an environment where I thought I knew what I'd come to photograph. When I got there, the, the light just wasn't working for that. And so I just explored further and further. And one morning, got up very early, way before dark, strapped down the snowshoes and the headlamp. All I could see was snow in, in the light of my headlamp. And when I got up to this high plane, I could see this little crack of light on the horizon. And I had scouted that plane the day before, and I, I was so excited. I just knew what I could do up there. This is not an iconic place. It's not a place anybody <laughs> will ever think to go, except for maybe in the summertime when they're, when they're hiking. Uh, but to get these photographs, it, it really does help if you have that mentality that I'm producing a landscape. So sometimes if, it, if, if the landmark is not speaking to you, look for the light. Usually that's where you'll find something. Hide and seek. This one, uh, I think, is probably the one that uh, is most closely connected to my own personal style. I love atmosphere. I love finding ways to hide the context of an image. And you'll probably notice this, this uh, image is uh, on some of the posters for, for this event. Um, this, is, this is, again, a little tiny peak in an area where I had a massive, probably 180 degree view of peaks. And again, it's a, it's a sub peak to a bunch of bigger ones. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really just zoomed in on that one because there's, there's light there and there's a story to tell, but also because I don't get too much of the context. It was this window of atmosphere and this little peak showing there. And even though it's big brother next door, was also out showing itself. There was a lot of context, and it didn't have the same sense of mystery about it. So this was an area where I could really isolate this one little peak, and there's this wonderful story about it coming out, surrounded by atmosphere. And of course, very soon after that, it was completely engulfed. This, this peak here reminded me of, uh, I don't know, so it's, it's a passing snow squall going over the peak. And again, another really famous set of peaks nearby. And this is the little one. It generally doesn't get all the love, although it's not, it's not, it is, it is still a very impressive peak that, that some people would know well. But um, I've often had people who've taken workshops with me and then they get into the post-processing session, get something like this, and they think, oh, well, we need to crank up the clarity slider. I can't see. I can't see enough of the peak <laughs> to me. It's like, no, 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 no. That's where the magic lies. The mystery of, of hiding something in the frame adds something to the image to a great extent. If you're just thinking in terms of this is a location, this is a favorite, famous mountain, and I need to show it very clearly, I need to give a very descriptive view of this very handsome mountain, you're not going to do this. But if you think that you want to infuse a little bit of mystery, a little bit of poetry into what you're doing, you might. And this can happen anywhere. Atmosphere can be moving sand for all I care. Uh, I just love it. I love those moments that do not reveal everything. They actually conceal a whole lot. These are those moments where the, the atmosphere is giving us the story by not giving us too much context and pulling us out of the story. So some images have almost no detail at all. It'd be very hard to tell where I was standing. Where are my feet? What does this place look like? This is just backlit sand at sunset, and all you're getting is a little bit of rim light off of the dunes, and to me, these dunes reminded me of ocean waves or something like that. Just a beautiful moment of light that takes you away from the fact that it's even a desert. And reminds you of something that it, that it isn't even. Right? So that's moving way beyond just the landscape. These moments can be super exciting. They don't have to be 
these, these bigger, grander scenes. They can be very, very exciting just by removing the context yourself through cropping. Find these, these moments where things come together and the strangeness is what you're showing, not the context. Now I could show you the top of the ridge line here and the sky above it. You'd get a greater sense of scale. I could put a person in the landscape. You'd get a greater sense of scale. We often hear that. Landscape really needs a person because that gives a sense of scale. <laughs> I, I'm of the opposite camp. I want to take the person out of there because it gives away the sense of scale, right? It gives away the game and it kind of robs the place of its mystery. I'd rather not show exactly the descriptive view of a place. I'd much rather show something that's a collaboration between me and nature. And sometimes that means just going really small, getting right down next to the ground and, and letting your imagination play with what's down there. And I, I believe that these are landscapes too, these sorts of images. In fact, uh, Years ago, I was speaking at a conference in England at which John Blakemore, a very celebrated British photographer, was speaking. And uh, he had reached, at that point, I think he was 80. And once he had reached 70, it became harder for him to go out to the areas that he frequented the most for landscape photography. He was getting a little less mobile. And so he spent 10 years photographing his living room as a landscape. And he said to the audience at, at that event, he said, and he showed, showed these images, and they were wonderful. They were very evocative of outdoor spaces. He just couldn't go out there anymore, so he did what he could, right? And he said, should we allow these as a sort of domestic landscape? I think we should. I agreed with him, right? So what is a landscape? It, it can be very wide open, but it, and a landscape, like I said, is, is a concept. And the more that you bring to that idea, uh, the more conceptual that it gets, usually the more interesting that it gets. So I love finding areas where I see something that it's not, like surf crashing on a beach in this case. It's not, it's two layers of mud coming together. But the more that you go out there and you just work with that, those sort of concepts of landscape, the more that you have to work with. So related to this idea of hide and seek is, and, and by the way, the seek part, I've been telling you all along without really emphasizing it, so I'll do that now. You are having to seek out what it is that you're looking for. If you're hiding part of it, you're also seeking, right? So exploration, I walked 10 miles through knee-high water in a river canyon to find this little patch of mud. So there's a lot of seeking involved in all of this too, but uh, that's a whole other talk that I often give is on exploration, but I just want to say that that is the other half of the hide and seek equation. So let's talk about embracing the unknown because this is this is where uh, this is where you just have a lot of opportunity. If, if you are struggling to get away from that idea of the location and what is important about this place supposedly, what do they tell me is important? Just go to a place where it's never the same. So sand dunes are awesome for that. They're always changing. That stuff's moving around all the time. Uh, good luck taking exactly the same photo twice. Although the dunes tend not to move that much. They are always changing character. They're subtly changing shape. I have this one dune that I take my, uh, my workshops to in Death Valley. I call it the squiggle dune. And the squiggle dune is now becoming more of a, it was a beautiful S curve, now it's more of a Z. You know, and sometimes it has sort of a corduroy finish and sometimes it looks like silk. Um, and it, it's just wonderful how much dunes change. You never really know exactly what you're going to find there. So if you can just sort of embrace these sorts of areas, mud tiles are another place. If you go out into these areas where the water is able to interact with fine silt, those will tend to form mud tiles and these are all over the Southwest. This one's in the Mojave Desert. These mud tiles were so big, I could stick my back then uh, Canon uh, EOS Mark III, uh, 5D Mark III, down into those cracks with a, a wide angle lens on it. No problem, they were, they were huge. <laughs> so um, amazing, you find that. And then this whole playa, I was told two weeks later, it was gone. 
So it was completely erased by nature. Another flood came in, covered it over, and that was the end of that. So now there might be something else there. It's wonderful to go out and explore and find areas where the ground itself is actually changing all the time. And even if you find just little patches of these areas, there's something that you can do with that too. It tells a great story about the place. Lots of places have this ability, the black sand deserts of Iceland, you can go out there and you, just, you really just never know what you're going to find. This little whorl on the edge of the lake, that's not always going to be there, right? It takes a certain set of conditions, certain water height, all, all sorts of things need to happen. The more that you go out and you just look for areas where things are likely to be changing, the more that you're going to get far away from that idea that you're doing something specific and descriptive. It's wonderful just to climb up high and look down on stuff. So here I am in Acadia National Park, just climbing up on a rock and looking down, and lo and behold, there's this crazy ring of, of undressed trees next to all of their friends showing off everything they've got. Right? Is it the circle of life, a circle of friends? These sorts of ideas really get my imagination going. And it does require just getting out in these areas where you don't know what you're going to find. It could be different. Certainly, a bunch of trees in autumn, that can change radically from one day to the next, especially as wind comes and their colors change. And so changing areas are an area where you can go and really find more than just what you expect to be there. Connect the dots. Let's talk about that. Now, what am I talking about connect, connecting the dots? Essentially, what I mean with, about that is, it, how are you going to present your images? Are you going to just present them as an expose on a specific location? Totally an option, and there are lots of good reasons why you might want to do that. Right? If you want to produce a, a documentary about why a certain area needs to be protected, it's going to be a movie about, or, or a, a book about that area, right? And you're going to have a series of images from that area. That's not necessary, um, but that, that sometimes, I should say sometimes that is necessary, but it, it isn't always. So let's just say if you're going to a place and there happen to be some sand dunes there, and there happen to be some salt creeks there, and you really like salt creeks, <laughs> and you really like the, the beautiful leathery textures of mud tiles, and you photograph that too, and you think that's so crazy, and oh my gosh, while I was there, there was a storm, and then there was this lingering atmosphere that just kind of hung around and played across the landscape, and it was like there was this one little fragment that was there for three days, and it was like, it was like that visitor who comes to stay at your house and just sleeps on the couch and never leaves, and there's so many stories that you can tell there. And then, and then we went back to the dunes, and, there, and then the, on the dunes there was this crazy correspondence between this amazing storm cloud overhead, and the way that it just, the angles of the clouds seemed to echo, the angles on the ground, and your compositional senses are just going crazy. And then you thought, well, there's this salt flat. There's this wonderful salt flat. And the way that the water is turning the salt into shapes that look like lace doilies, isn't it crazy how that works? It's amazing how nature can do that. And then you went to this other larger basin, and the salt there was turning into these polka dots that people call the potholes, and they seemed to go on forever. And, and lo and behold, the sky realized that the ground forgot one, and it's bringing, it, bringing that little hole of one that, hole that matches what you see on the ground. And there's a story there, isn't it? It's the missing piece. The sky is bringing it down to join the puzzle on the ground. Now, I could, have, I could, I could tell so many stories, and there's so many things that I could say about all these amazing places. And, and if I'm just putting these images in my portfolio or if I'm just sharing them, there's so much that I can say besides the fact that everything that I've just shown you was in Death Valley, right? Okay, so maybe that's not always the most important point. That would be one way of connecting the dots. I could leave all of that out that I just said. I would say, here's a bunch of shots from Death Valley. When we do that, 
And there's really not any immediate need to do that. We're missing an opportunity to do other things and to remind our audience that there is much more to Death Valley than Death Valley. There is our relationship with it. There is that human element that the photographer brings to it, the decisions that the photographer makes. So another thing that might really interest you, another way of presenting your images might be some other themes. Maybe you really like sunlit craggy peaks, <laughs> okay? And you might find sunlit craggy peaks in places where most people don't go because they're looking for something else and you're just looking for sunlit craggy peaks. <laughs> And so you're loving nature, you're loving these, these areas, right? But you don't need to direct everyone to them and tell them that if you, if this is a photo about X, and if you go to X, you can have that photo too. Different message, right? Different sunlit craggy peak, different place. I could produce a whole portfolio of images on just sunlit craggy peaks <laughs> because I do this a lot. And they could be from all over the world. And I could still tell a very nature-oriented story about these, these areas. There's, there's just, there's always so much to say. Here we are yet again, totally different environment, totally different biome, more sunlit craggy peaks, in this case, sea stacks, right? And none of these are even in the same country. They're not the same environments, but they are still nature. Nature giving us these beautiful moments and the more that we get people interested in looking for something other than a location and a specific spot where those tripod, hole, tripod holes are, the more that we encourage them to think about what our contributions are to the photograph, what it is that we bring to it, which is so much more than just, just a, a, an identified place on a map. So the sunlit craggy peaks thing, it could be interesting immersive landscapes and dialogues between what's on the ground and what's in the background. I love finding those sorts of things too. Or you know, the way that the, the ground is always changing. There's so many stories you can tell about that. These environments, this crazy red lava rock in Iceland. Again, similar compositional interests. Getting low to the ground with mud tiles. I've already shown you a number of these, but in this case, I called this image moon dial because to me, there was something about the passage of time going on here, which is hard to ignore when you realize that these environments are so changeable. And that image that I, one of the earliest images that I showed you, of a desert with pink flowers, I called this one kindred spirits because it so reminded me of that one. So I'm producing a theme a companion piece on a theme of two totally different areas, right? So I'm, I'm totally appreciating the fact that these are fragile plants in fragile areas in two different areas and in an area where very few people would ever be able to find this because we were traveling out uh, in monster trucks out in the highlands of Iceland, uh, rolling around like a giant creative laboratory for nine days. Um, but it could just as well be some place where people could find it easily. And, you know, there are all sorts of ramifications for directing people to those sorts of places without giving them a whole lot more to think about. So I already talked about atmosphere. I love the way that atmosphere can tell a story and give you something that isn't always there. The way that the atmosphere is just clinging on to this pyramidal peak in the background, or the way that the atmosphere here seems to get, look like an asteroid or a comet shooting through the air. Or the way that the atmosphere here allows these trees all to seem to be in chorus together, moving out of the way or leaning in and waiting for the light to shine through. Or the way that the atmosphere rakes across a landscape and you get some sense of the way that those formations of rock were actually were formed because of the interplay of the weather and the light and the forces. And I saw, sometimes see things that aren't really there, a rocket ship taking off, for example. If you're really in, and if you're really interested in, in, landscape, uh, in atmosphere like I am, you'll find it, like I said, in the strangest of places, like the deserts of California. And you'll see it in things that aren't even the atmosphere. This is just water, but to me it looks like a bunch of clouds swirling around at the bottom of a waterfall. So, 
these, these sorts of opportunities for you to really dig in and explore, and by explore, I don't just mean boots on the ground. I mean exploring ideas. They're everywhere. Maybe you're really interested in seasonal runoff. You can find some seasonal runoff in lots of places. The way that that is not always there is fascinating. I love the way the waterfalls change their force and their power depending on the season. Sometimes seasonal runoff produces streams that are not there any other time of the year. And it's just marvelous to be able to go out there. And if that's your project, you really want, you're really interested in that, you will find it, and you will put more of yourself into that. So lastly, let's talk about this fifth idea of speaking softly. And by that, I mean there are a number of choices you can make after the photograph is done. After you've put all of yourself into it, you've processed it, and you've decided to put it out there, we all like to think that a photo should speak for itself. And in many ways, it always will. It will never say exactly what you want it to and people, because people will understand what they see in it, what they bring to it. And as I said, that's part of the fun. But what you do say matters. And we have so many opportunities to say something about our photographs, whether that is just titling them. Now, there's nothing wrong with just putting a location name on, as your title. And in fact, it's more expedient. There's a lot less mental energy that goes into that, right? It's pretty hard to sit down and what are you going to call it? I called this one Gold Rush. Right? Personally, I would rather come up with a title that's trite rather than the one that seems indifferent. I'm hoping that by giving my photos that kind of a title, that it encourages people to think a little bit beyond the location. May not always work, but it's, it's worth a try. I called this one The Maw. I saw this big mouth of a monster or something in the forest, and it gives me ideas. It's not just what happens afterwards. Actually, while you're in the field, language coming into play can be very useful. What do you see, and how can you make someone else maybe see that? So what you have to say about the images can also either direct people to them or not. You might have an area like this that's incredibly fragile. And then you might want to think twice about telling people exactly where that is in your caption. Now, there's been a whole um, brouhaha over geotagging, and I won't get into that. But I'll just say that my, my approach is it's all the same. Everything is fragile and needs to be protected. And so I'm just kind of vague about it. This is in the Mojave Desert. That's enough. Right? That's as far as I go. Um, because some places, OK, sand dunes, they're maybe not that fragile. But that way, I don't have to make the call. I don't have to be the one to say, how fragile is that place? How much does it need to be protected? I'd rather just assume that they all do. So there you have it, the five. Light before landmarks, hide and seek, embrace the unknown, connect the dots, and speak softly. If you are able to embrace these ideas, I think you'll go farther with understanding that photography does have that third ingredient, which is you, and that what you're doing is having a relationship with the land, and that can only lead to good things. So the next time you're out in nature with your camera and you're looking around, ask yourself this. Is what I see here just a location, or can I find myself here too? Thank you.